By 1920, 35,000 African Americans lived in Indianapolis, more than double the number of 20 years earlier. That constituted more than 11% of the population, the highest black percentage among major northern cities. The 80 black high school students in 1910 became 800 in 1920. For many white parents, that was 800 too much. It was all too much. Fear became firestorm. They were encroaching on neighborhoods. There was this fear that there are too many Negroes coming, in, coming into Indianapolis. They're invading Indianapolis. And the only way that we're going to get a handle on it is to create segregation. Civic groups sprung up. Mrs. Daisy Dean Deeds and her White Supremacy League calling out for red-blooded, all-white gentlemen to join the cause. The White People's Protective League, the Capitol Avenue Protective Association, the Mapleton Civic Association. None of these was considered extremist. Their members were among the most respected citizens in the city. Their goal was unmuddied. It really all goes back to bullying. You know, people say, we're, we're going to do this and we're not going to allow you in. And we have the power, we have the might, we have the ability to keep you out. And this is how we're going to do it. In education, 1922 marked the boiling point. The civic group slashed onto a medical argument, claiming a separate high school was necessitated by the disproportionate level of tuberculosis among blacks. Though that was hardly surprising given the overcrowding in their penned-in neighborhoods and the fact that only one wing of one hospital would treat them. The Chamber of Commerce joined the segregation push, as did parent-teacher organizations and the principal of Shortridge, the school whose namesake had integrated high schools a half-century earlier. The Indianapolis Times, which a few years later would win a Pulitzer Prize for its anti-Klan crusade, called integrated schooling indefensible. It all begged the question of not which whites supported the creation of a black high school, but if any did not. A few in the black community were in favor of a segregated high school because it meant more black teaching jobs. But the heavy majority objected, castigating it as unjust, un-American, and against the spirit of democratic ideals. The protest went unmentioned and unanswered when the school board spun out its unanimous decision. Praising the laudable desire of blacks to want to attend high school, the city would build them one of their very own. These were children. These were young people. They were not wishing them well. They were just trying to get them out of, out of their white school, see. And this was the board of school commissioners who was supposed to look out for every child under their watch. And then the Ku Klux Klan crashed Indiana in full, and things got even worse. The Klan in Indiana was a comet. It just seemed to come out of nowhere, and it grew like wildfire. Thousands and tens of thousands of people rushed to join this organization. On Independence Day, 1923, David Curtis Stevenson's plane touched down at a massive rally in Kokomo, reportedly the largest Klan meeting ever. And a growing Indiana movement took off. Transplanted Oklahoman, charismatic salesman, bully, womanizer, and charlatan, Stevenson set up shop in the Kresge building in downtown Indianapolis took up residence at a former Butler sorority remodeled to resemble the Klan's national headquarters in Atlanta, and built a Klan empire unsurpassed in the history of the North. At its peak in the mid-1920s, there were 300,000 to 400,000 dues-paying Klansmen and women in the state, between a quarter and a third of the white population. A 1924 rally brought tens of thousands of them to the state fairgrounds and downtown for a muscle-flexing parade. By 1925, the Indiana governor, the Indianapolis mayor, the majority of the state legislature, and all five members of the newly elected Indianapolis school board were either Klansmen or Klan-backed. Indeed, while the Klan of the 1920s more openly denounced Catholic Jews and immigrants, it also stayed true to its anti-black roots. And while the Klan's reign in Indiana lasted but a few years, and legislatively it accomplished next to nothing, its stomach-turning collapse created a stain that no amount of time can scrub clean. When D.C. Stevenson kidnapped, raped, tortured, and partially cannibalized the 28-year-old Indianapolis woman, it triggered the end of the Klan's reign and was covered coast to coast. And when, in an effort to extort his release, he desperately started revealing names of hundreds of government officials in the Klan's sway, Indiana 
became a national embarrassment. Amid the uproar, cut off in virtually every way from the national hubris of the Roaring Twenties, African Americans in Indianapolis huddled ever closer. Three main pockets had developed, the most concentrated on the near west side, close to the city's first settlement a century earlier. It was known as the Bottoms, a low-lying, bug-infested hodgepodge of tar paper shacks, outhouses, and pre-industrial poverty surrounded by Fall Creek, the White River, and the foul Central Canal, the area that is now the IUPUI campus. The Klan's demise had affected the desire for a segregated high school not a bit, and it was here that it would go. Objections that the site was three blocks from a dump and a noxious glue factory went unheeded. A lawsuit to prevent the school from being built failed, was appealed, and failed again. When a fire destroyed a black elementary school, the principals at three neighboring white schools offered to take in the students. Instead, claiming it had nothing to do with race, the school board chose to bust the students to a condemned building 10 miles away. Dismaying, seemingly for the first time, many white leaders as well. So you're the average newspaper reader in Indianapolis, and you're saying, wait a minute, there are these schools that will absorb these kids at very little or perhaps not even any cost at all. And meanwhile, we're going to absorb the cost of transportation, the, the cost of rehab for this abandoned building, and the construction of 10 additional classrooms just to maintain a structure that you say is not race-based? You know, it's not race-based. So, well, what is it? Elsewhere, integration was making inroads. In 1946, Gary leaders headed off a fight by proactively integrating schools. In 1948, after 21 years, Butler University rescinded its annual limit of 10 incoming African Americans. The year before at Indiana University, Bill Garrett, who would later coach at Attucks, integrated the basketball team. By this point, Indianapolis reportedly was the only major northern city with a segregated school system. But when prominent white politicians such as William Fortune joined Jewish and women's groups in pushing for change, and when even staunch Republican Eugene Pulliam publisher of the conservative Indianapolis Star, joined the cause. The future was clear. On March 8, 1949, Governor Henry Schricker made it law. For the first time in state history, race could play no role in where a student could attend public school. Only one problem. The law that promised a sea change, a death blow to segregation, Willard Ransom proclaimed, made ripples like a pebble. It wasn't like, okay, this bill passed, and, and next school year in 1950, you have all the black kids going to other, other schools, and no, it didn't happen like that at all. The law, 1949 law, should have any discrimination. The execution of the law and the tolerance of that execution delayed integration, true integration, for at least 18 more years. This is Indianapolis, crossroads of America, hub of the state. Most of us think our city is a mighty good place to live. This too is Indianapolis, the part often overlooked, neglected, left to rot. These are our slums. In the 1950s, even as the Crispus Attucks basketball team was bringing people together, the heart of the black community was coming apart. Outside of Lockfield Gardens, much of the near west side still wallowed in extreme poverty. As African Americans continued to pour into the city and restrictive housing covenants, whites only clauses weren't removed from the real estate board bylaws until the mid 60s, continued to pen them in. A series of housing studies exposed the problem, but where African Americans saw a need to improve conditions, city government saw an opportunity for a different kind of renewal, an opportunity that would also meet a desire by IUPUI to expand its medical campus. Having used up its available land, it needed room to grow, but the area was hemmed in by White River on the west, Fall Creek on the north, and slums on the other two sides. The answer? Redevelopment. The result, 
the massive displacement of Indianapolis's near west side black community. More than 10,000 people were forced out of their homes, most of which were destroyed. Some families received money, though in many cases not enough to find comparable housing elsewhere. Others simply saw their homes condemned or claimed by eminent domain. Unlike with federal relocation rules, the city didn't take responsibility for helping people find new homes, instead vowing to give it every consideration. The Flanner Home self-building project helped, but not nearly enough. Great pillars of the black community, such as Lockfield Gardens and Indiana Avenue, started a steep descent, exacerbated when Interstate 65 was rerouted downtown beginning in the 1960s. The hardest thing I saw, the hardest thing I saw in, in researching this project was a picture. And the picture actually is on the cover of my book. And it's a two-story outhouse. And I was like, in Indianapolis, a stone's throw from the Capitol, is a two st people using a two-story outhouse. It was the one time I was at the archive where I just had to go take a walk because I, I just couldn't fathom how that would be allowed and how that would be tolerated. And clearly, it was part of the motivation for the urban renewal. But without looking at the conditions that brought that into being, that reality into being, and the complicity that the city fathers had in creating that system or creating that reality, it was just, it was just blind. They were just blind to it. Instead, they said, let's remove it and wish them the best of luck. They used to call it, <laughs> urban renewal is Negro removal we would be naive not to look at the financial incentive to destroy a neighborhood and not provide public housing or some kind of remedy or some kind of assistance for them to move somewhere else in the community. It's, it's, it's predatory. The dilemma for me is always that, you know, now, you know, I believe the state government and sometimes the university itself um, simply don't have um, the courage to face up to, the, to that heritage. So we don't have that discussion and it becomes more complicated because we don't have that honest and sober discussion out in public and understand that we were in fact complicitous. We did fuel urban renewal. We actively contributed to it and encouraged it. Educational inequity persisted as well. By 1953, just four years after the School Desegregation Act, City leaders and newspapers were trumpeting victory, even touting Indy as an example for southern cities to follow. They pointed out that two-thirds of Indianapolis students now went to integrated schools, which included all but one of the city's public high schools, Attucks. But a closer look told a different story. In four of eight high schools, less than 6% of students were black, while Attucks wouldn't see a white student for a decade and a half. Black students who lived closer to Shortridge and Washington were assigned to Attucks. White students who lived by Attucks were sent elsewhere. In 1957, Thomas Howe High School had 12 black students. Broad Ripple had one. African Americans continued to push for true reform. Fittingly, the biggest push came from a longtime Crispus Attucks teacher. Andrew Ramsey started teaching languages at Attucks in 1935 and in the 1940s began a nearly three-decade run as columnist for the Indianapolis Recorder. His ire hit both sides of the racial aisle, whites for clinging to Indy's segregationist roots, blacks for not fighting back harder. And he was one of the few public school teachers who was really active in the uh, civil rights movement. Built in the hands-on mold of Matthias Nolcox, Ramsey championed civil rights, tackling causes of all nature and joining sit-ins during his lunch hour at restaurants that refused to serve blacks. True to form, he successfully appealed to the Indiana Civil Rights Commission to force a transfer out of Attucks and into mostly white Howe High School, claiming that students there were being discriminated against by not being exposed to African Americans. And he would receive these late night calls about, you know, you're a communist, so we're gonna kill you, we're gonna uh, come out there and burn your house down, but he didn't care. Mr. Ramsey didn't care. He was the, one of the most heroic man I've known in life. You know, he, he was fantastic. He was brave. 
There are a lot of people who excel, but there's so few people, so few of us who are, are brave. People would say, oh, you, you, you're you going too fast. You say, well, how fast, I mean, how fast am I going? You know, we can't wait. It was Ramsey who found the key to change. Frustrated by the school board's tenacity at fending off integration, he determined the solution would have to come from outside. Helped by Indianapolis' new Urban League, the NAACP, and a team of top black attorneys, Ramsey counseled an IPS family to take his complaint of unfair treatment not to the school board or state authorities, as was the usual practice, but rather to the Justice Department of the United States. It was this letter, by one unhappy parent, that brought down the system. In 1968, as racial and political tension roiled the country. I have some very sad news for all of you. Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. The Justice Department sued Indianapolis public schools. Three years later, in a monumental ruling by federal judge S. Hugh Dillon, all of IPS's warts were revealed. Of 350 school district boundary changes since 1954, more than 90% were found to have promoted segregation. Additions had been built to old, overcrowded black schools rather than transferring students to white schools with vacant classrooms. Sites for new schools had been chosen to minimize black enrollment. In short, IPS was guilty of de jure segregation. And Dillon's rebuke couldn't have been more plain. What followed was mostly one-way busing, black students out to the suburbs, and a litany of motions and appeals nearly impossible to follow and still causing controversy when the plan was finally phased out in 2016. Racial equity is access to opportunity, it's access to power even. Power to excel is critical, in fact, because we are very, very, sick and tired of always seeing black and brown children at the bottom. And by the way, let me say that I have been in this district now over 57 years, so I have been able to see the process as it has been built. Uh, but this, we are at the point now where both the superintendent and the board are in sync and in fact have six priorities and one of the most prominent one is a racial equity mindset. Uh, when parents come in to enroll, what are we doing? What are our best practices? Uh, are we being supportive of the needs? And basically like Newcomer is one of those places where the district um, is open. Um, these are, this is a place where students, this is their first uh, door that they come in, so we want this to be a long-lasting impression. So we have to talk about uh, what does it look like for a student who is uh, new to the country? Are there obstacles that are in the way that we can remove? Uh, how can we improve their outcomes? Um, what are we doing on our side? We've done multiple things over, over different years. Um, we started out really small with people getting trained um, and setting the vision that we were going to talk about race. So every, once we decided that, uh, that's our third question on our interview when we interview people. Are you, we're a race equity school. What do race and equity have to do with teaching and learning? I parent with my husband three uh, teenage boys, two, a set of twins and then a singleton, we call them. Um, and the singleton said to me one day, his name's JT, he said, Mom, don't you wish some days that you didn't have to be black in America? That's not okay. And yet, here it is playing out in front of our children, um, this idea that race really doesn't matter. And yet it does, right? It does. And they, and they not only see it, but they can articulate it. And then they're saying things like, you know, hey, mom, I, I just would like to not be black in America. We've got to understand that this is a journey that we are on, all on. It's, it's a never ending journey, in fact and it's just so critical that the community joins in and understands the importance of what the leadership in this school district is now doing and joins us so that we can all be working together on this so that every child in our school districts has access 
to equity, and there is a difference between equality and equity. Equity is what we are reaching for.